Every time I hear that music, I just get crazy. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Andre the Beast Creighton Show. You know what? Before we started, I was listening to this song that Jason had. You know I'm going to say it. You can, you can hate me now. And two of my guests are truly legendary. And believe me, they know that word, you can hate me now. Especially when you're playing football. Everybody wants to be the man. You know, as a young guy playing football myself, you always have those what I call the gods. The guys that knew how to throw the football. The guys that knew how to run the football. The guys that really made the difference. Uh, I call them the guys of the, of the NFL. And I am privileged today to have on my show two of my all-time favorites, Mr. Icky Woods from the Icky Shuffle Cincinnati Bengals and one of the best running backs that probably ever played the game. High school, college, the NFL, the USFL, my man, Mr. American Nightmare himself, Marcus Dupree. Hey guys, welcome to the show. <laughs> Oh, thank you, brother. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate it, man. Appreciate yeah. being on with you. Yeah, your check is in the mail, too, for all that, you know. Icky wasn't my check. Hey, he, was, he wasn't far off. He wasn't far <laughs> off at all, boy. You know that, boy. You was, you was the thing, boy, back in the day, baby. We both was, man. We had some fun playing the game, man. That's what no I'm doubt, bro. No doubt. No doubt. You know, I was telling these guys that um, – the purpose of the show is that beast frame of mind and I'm always looking for entertaining guests but not just entertaining guests but guests that have overcome adversity and still to this day is making a difference not only in their own careers and their own families but impacting the masses and let's start with you Icky I mean you're from California I remember watching U.S. Uh, U, um, the University of Nevada Rebels playing, and I remember hearing that name Icky, and I was like, "Who in the heck is Icky Woods?" <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, well, man, my birth given name, you know, my government handle is Elbert. My grandfather named me, and my mom said she cried when he named me. He uh, wanted to name. Um, one of his grandbabies because he ain't never named one and he stuck me with the label Elbert. So um, I was one, my older brother was two and he couldn't pronounce Elbert. So he used to call me E.E. -E all the time. So <laughs> in order to make it simple for him, my mother started calling me Icky and it's kind of ironic. We grew up Koki and Icky. His name was Koki, my name was Icky. So it stuck, you know, I was in high school, man. And I, and I was running that ball, man, and had a great game. and. <laughs> <laughs> and seeing that uh, Icky and uh, in Inc Icky Woods, you know, rush for 200 and 210 yards, three touchdowns. Yeah. And, boy, and, that, and, and that was all it took, man. I said, oh, yeah, we're going to stick with Icky, man. We're going to stick with it. So, Icky, how is the competition in, in California? You know, you really don't hear a lot about football players coming out of, out of California. So, uh, it, was it big in your community? Was football really big in your community? Yeah, football, those State of California got some good ball players come up out of there, man. Don't don't do us like that, come man. On now. Nobody I, I, I don't, I, I, Cut I, that I, out, man. <laughs> Cut it out, man. 
<laughs> you gotta have some dogs come out of Cali, man. You know, you know me, Henry Ellis, Tim, Tim McDonald. You know, we gonna have some dogs come out that thing, man. Okay. But, uh, but you, you know, it, it's not as big as you know as as, as Texas and, and and all of Oklahoma and all those states, though. They 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 do football year round. You know, football is starting to be a year round thing anyway. Right. But yeah, man, we had a couple of dogs come out of there. Randall Cunningham is from California too, man. So we had a few few come out of there and, and grace their presence in the NFL. So it's a it's a good thing. Sam Bam Cunningham, uh, uh, Margaret Allen. Yeah, yeah. I think it's from Cali, man. So we we had a few few guys come up out from out that way, man. How? But it's a you know football is a is is all around sport, man. And you know you get them from all walks of life, man. From from every every uh, corner of the country, man. Because kids love to play that game, man. And you know we us growing up, man. That was that was our way out, man. You know our way to get out of. Uh, of you know of, of the the ghetto, the poverty, man, and you know was blessed. At least I was blessed with the talent to play football, and I was able to do something with it and and get myself out of the situation. Was your family real supportive of, of you playing football? Did you have a supporting cast? Or yeah, I, I had a supporting cast, and I had a lot of prayers, man. Because you know I was a I was a hard head thing coming up, man. You know I. Dabbing a little bit in, uh, you know, trying to do that gang thing, selling drugs, and man, because it was because it was what I knew, man. And, you know, it was the environment that I grew up in, and you know, we all try to cater to that environment that we in, man, to to try to get out. And like I said, I was fortunate enough to be blessed with the talent to play football, and you know, and that and that got me out of my situation. I was able to go off to college, the UNLV, and. Uh, my senior year ended up leading the nation in rushing and was the first player taken in the second round by the Cincinnati Bengals, man. So I was one of the uh, fortunate ones to get out and, you know, and I, I try to go back and talk to the kids and let them know that there is a there is a different way than what they see on a day to day basis. What was the what was the light that clicked that you said you naturally was you know got involved in the gang activity the drugs? What when was the moment that that light clicked and you say you know what there has to be something better for me out here? Well, it, it, it was when my best my best homie got killed. Man, uh, I was going into my senior year and a, a guy by the name of Andre Horn, which is like a brother to me, man and. And I'll be honest with you, bro, I was getting ready to quit school, man, and, and dabble a little bit in the game, man. And my boy got shot 19 times and they cut his throat. And I said, no, nah, that ain't the way for me. So I went and did the football thing. And then I had a, a new running back coach come in by the name of John Montgomery, showed me that he cared about me as a, a as a human being and not not just a football player. And uh, we were able to uh, went in and sat down and talked to him. And he just asked me a simple question. He said, "Son, do you want to play in the NFL one day?" And I was like, "Yeah, of course I do." I said, "What? What? What <laughs> college player don't want to play in the NFL?" Right. He said, "Well, I tell you what, son. You give me 110 percent, and you do everything I tell you to do. I guarantee you be a first and second round draft choice." And I looked at this guy like, man, this guy, I, don't need, I, don't need, I just met this guy. I don't know this guy from Adam. But I said, what you got to lose, man? You got one year left. You know, just you you tried it your way for the last three years. It didn't work. Let's try something else. And I ended up doing it his way, man. And like I said, we, we, we led the nation in rushing. And I was the first player taken in the second round. How important was that that speech or that mentor to you as far as moving ahead in, in your I think, career? I think it was very important, man, because you, you got a guy who comes in and say, hey, you know, we're going to start from square one. I don't care what people said about you. They wasn't really saying nice things about you, but I'm going to start at square one. We're going to go from right here. We're going to move forward. And I want to let you know that I believe in you. I think you can get it done. You my ride or die. Let's make it happen. And, you know, and he came in and showed that he not only did he care about me as a football player, he cared about me as an individual, you know. And, and, and I think that was the most important thing is, you know, most college kids, when they go off to college, they're just a number. And, and sometimes they treat you like a number. Mm -hmm. But this guy came in and showed that he cared about me as a person and not as a football player. And I think that 
that's what got me over the edge is that, hey, man, this guy really cares about me. He's just not trying to use me to play football. When do you, What do you think was your best season? Was it your senior year? Yeah, so senior year was my basically my only season, actually, because before that, man, I was there for three years, and I think I rushed for about a total of 400 yards, man. I had a, a big game in the California Bowl my freshman year. Round, we rode the back of Randall Cunningham to the California <laughs> Bowl that year, and uh, I, had, I got a chance to play in the – in the big game, uh, Tony Lewis, who was our starting fullback, had hurt his back, and I got a chance to come in as a freshman. And actually, we played that in my hometown of Fresno. Right. So I had a chance to come in and, and score a touchdown in the California Bowl in my hometown, man. That was unbelievable. Why do you think it took to your senior year to really to blossom? Was it because you, didn't, you wasn't given a lot of opportunities or – you just the 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 what the coaches told you all of a sudden just registered it's like now is my time to get this done no man i think i think it was hard hard headedness man i i was trying to do shit my way and so excuse my language i was trying to do You're stuff fine. my way instead of their way man so so it was uh so it it, it took me a while to uh understand that you know you can't do it your way. You got to do it their way because if you don't do it their way, you're not going to play. So uh, it took me to my senior year to understand that, you know, cause I, was a, I was still thugging, man, and, I, you know, I hadn't made my mind up yet that I really wanted to be a, a football player. I knew I could play football. I was a thug playing football. I wasn't a, <laughs> a football player trying to be a thug, you know. So when I uh, finally, you know, got my head on straight and, like I said, with the – my homeboy being killed, man, it kind of let me know that, that that the thug life wasn't for me. It was time for me to buckle it down and, you know, take the football thing serious. Marcus, you, can you relate to any of the stuff that Icky's talking about? Oh, no doubt, man. You know, you see tons of kids today uh, probably go through – I mean, most athletes go through the same thing, especially, like you say, he, he, he was thugging out there. You got kids nowadays and – and being from hard time Mississippi, bro, we trying to make it. We trying to figure out a way how to get get out, get out of our situation. I mean, you got tons of tons of athletes that come out of Mississippi. At one time, we were rated the number one, I guess, for the the, the population, the capital. We had the most NFL players that are from Mississippi mm -hmm. per capita. I mean, I got 60 guys living around me right now that are ex NFL players that live around my neighborhood right now. Uh, so I can feel where he's coming from. I understand it. I, I preach that same situation to my grandkids that are being recruited right now. You know, you got this is the way to, to move your life forward. Keep it going. Stay positive, and uh, it's the way to get out of, out of the hood. Take the viewers, Marcus, down down a little bit down your road, like Icky just did from. You know, going to high school and the transition going into uh, the college. We won't talk about you guys' NFL career right now. We're just talking about going from the high school, the transition into college. And who actually, because your path was a little bit different, Marcus. You had a lot of people pulling at your 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 strings. You was the number one recruit in the in the country. So take me down that a little bit. Well, you know, as a you know, coming up as a Young kid in Mississippi, uh, watching the New Orleans Saints, we always wanted to be part of, you know, want to be in that, you know, being fans of the Saints and Archer Manning being from Mississippi, you know, everybody wanted to play for the Saints. But we knew we had to do certain things that we had to go through. Uh, like I say, being in, in Mississippi is, is, a, is a poor, was at, at one time and probably, you know, kind of still is a poor state. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, you got to find a way to to get out get out of the situation you're in. Uh, I just happen to be blessed to have a uh, not just one person being in my life, but I had a whole village where I live. I mean, all my friends that I grow grow grew up with and t you know talk to today, we had good mamas that would push us and got us where we need to be. Good grandmamas who who washed our clothes and made sure that we got got to practice on time. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came through. My hometown of Philadelphia, we just had a great situation that I was blessed to be a part of. Um, just being in Boy Scout, keeping us busy, being right. playing because I played baseball. A lot of people don't know I played baseball. I played baseball. I played basketball. I ran track. 
Mm. I mean, my mom was a school teacher. My grandfather was a minister. So they kept us busy. And I was blessed to have that village that we, that the kids don't really have that today back in my hometown. So it was just blessed to have a, a village. And I, I then I ended up getting a good coach who came in and started coaching there, Coach Wood, who'd been a part of a winning program at Kosciuszko, Mississippi. And they produced a lot of athletes out of that, out of that, out of that high school. So he came over and, and we ran a wishbone and then the rest of it was history, man. We, he put us in the right situation to win. And like Icky was talking about, he cared about us as a person. I talked to my coach right now, I go to his house, I eat dinner with him. I mean, he took us around, he took us to colleges. He made sure that we was on the right path all the time and stayed positive in what we were doing. I'm at either you or Icky can answer this. How important was those two figures in high school and were, and what was the difference between the figures in high school versus the role models you or Icky can answer this when you transition into college because there's a difference between being the number one recruit versus getting a scholarship and going to college you're number one everybody's tugging at you so they're going to tell you whatever you want to hear so tell the viewers what that was like for both you and Icky when it, when you when it was time to go and into the college rankings you want me to go first? Yeah, go, go, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, because you had them tugging at you. I, I didn't have them tugging like, like you did. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, at the time, Beast, I was just, Andre, I was just, you know, just a kid, this old country boy, trying to make it, just making sure that my mom didn't have to pay for me to go to college. Yeah. My friends, again, once again, we all had the same mindset. We got to do this so our moms don't have to pay for us to go to college. Right. So we did whatever it took, however it took, whenever wherever we need to go to play ball, we did it. I mean, I don't play it in cow pastors. I don't play it in, <laughs> on the street, whatever. You know, we were making sure that we are prepared to make, make the move so our parents didn't have to play. I mean, they had to pay for us to go to college, basically. Mm -hmm. Icky? Yeah, same, same, same here. Um, uh, my, mine was a little different because I, uh, like I said, I, I had a couple of good uh, years, and my senior year was a was a good year. I, I didn't have anybody there to uh, kind of tell me that when a college send you a letter, you're supposed to send the questionnaire back. So I had, I had a whole box full of, full of questionnaires that I never <laughs> sent back to any colleges. You know, I would go and get my box and, and look at all these all these schools sending me sending me the questionnaire and and nobody told me that I had to send I had to send those back to let those schools know that I was interested in you know maybe coming there but I did have uh, I want I actually wanted to go to Fresno State which is my hometown the college in my hometown but the uh, head coach at the time wasn't giving in-town kids scholarship and so UNLV came in and, and they recruited me very heavily and then when I went to the trip to Vegas, baby, I was sold, man. I, yeah, that's, that's why I'm going right here, boy. They, they showed a brother a nice time, and I was actually able to get down there. And, you know, a, a, as you go and you learn, you know, you learn what not to do and what you can do. And so you knew when, when, you, when you went to school in Vegas that you couldn't live there and try to gamble and do anything like that. So you kind of stayed away from – the strip the biggest thing about vegas man is every weekend it was a whole different scene you know because yeah. you have people coming in every weekend different scene and it was just you know then and the strip was great man it was just a wonderful place to to play and then and then we had the basketball team what was off the chain with jerry tarkanian man and, you guys were monsters man that basketball yeah. man oh man they, they they were off the chain but on my recruiting trip they took me in to see Jerry Tarkanian because, you know, he was, he, he was a big wig on campus, and so he was helping with recruiting the guys. And, you know, and the basketball team was well known, and you would go into his office. He's got that big old elaborate office. You walk in there <laughs> and be in awe, and then he say, son, we're trying to build a football program here, and we want you to be a part of that. Yeah. And, you know, when he said that, man, I'm sold. Okay, let's make it happen, <laughs> baby. Let's make it happen. So it was, it was a fun time, man, to, you know, to, to go there and was there for four years. And like I said, I was fortunate enough my senior year to lead the nation in rushing and, and be able to make it to the, to the NFL. Marcus, you also shared 
some of the same tragedies that Icky just had, the loss of um, loss of a good friend that kind of changed and impact your life as well. Can you share with us a little bit about that struggle that you went through? Well, you know, when I was going to, you talking about lately or? No, when you guys were going, before your transition or into uh, college, I think you, we talked about it a little bit. You had lost one of your good friends or? Well, that was this, this past year. Now, it wasn't back, I didn't lose anybody when we came through high school and in and, and the college. That was just like last year, my best friend that we grew up from yeah, from, yeah. from the neighborhood. Okay. But I'm, I'm like Icky. When I went to Oklahoma, I was doing all these trips, going everywhere, and being the number one player in the country. I'm still a naive country boy. I'm just glad to be on the team, glad to be part of what we're doing, glad to be in the, in the uh, you know, just in the number. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I still didn't realize I was the number one player in the country. I was just like at the end of the day, making sure my mom didn't have to pay for me to go to school. That's all that mattered to me. When did but when I went to Oklahoma, went to Texas, I, you know, all I'm going to tell you is the same thing. But what stuck out to me about Oklahoma, because at that time they had a black quarterback. And uh, Jimmy I, I, I always watched that. They had J.C. Washington. Had, before that was Thomas Lott. You know, I, I looked at that part because – black quarterbacks wasn't, wasn't really mentioned back then. Mm-hmm. And so the opportunity to be able to go, come and play at the University of Oklahoma and be a part of uh, Coach Switzer even had that swag. You yeah. know, he he was talking that crap and, and he, <laughs> we put a half a hundred on and you keep on playing around with, with us at halftime. You know, he just had, he just, he could he could relate to a lot of the black players. Uh, he grew up around black people. So that kind of it brought me to Oklahoma, uh, just being a part of that tradition, too. Marcus, when you realize that you are the number one player, the number one recruit, when did it click and what happened? How did you change? Bruh. Hey, bro, it never did click. Really? <laughs> I'm telling you, I just, <laughs> I always felt like I had something to prove. I always felt like I got, every day I got to get better. I, I went to Oklahoma so I could find out how good I could be. Right. I wanted to play with other talented people. I wanted to, I wanted to be pushed. You know, I went to Oklahoma. They had ten running backs ahead of me, and so most of the time freshmen don't at that time didn't even make the team. They didn't even play on the. You know, you had the red shirt. Right. So I was gonna make up my mind. You know, the first scrimmage against the. You know, we had a scrimmage the first 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 two weeks there. We had a scrimmage, and you know, I'm a fourteen tailback. So we're going against – I'm going against the number one defense in the country at that time. I said, well, <laughs> if I can run against these boys, I know right. I can play. Right. And I think I had like nine carries, 150 yards against the first team defense. Oh, I said, oh, yeah, I can play in this league. Let's go. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so so the, 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 the question goes like this. Okay, so we know we can play now. So now, if you take us down that, that path – as we move forward here. Take us down that path. Now your dreams come true because now, Icky, your coach is telling you the prophecy is about to happen. You you know it's time to get ready for the NFL, and your coach says, hey, this is where you want to go. And the same thing goes to you, Marcus. When does the preparation change? It, it, it doesn't really change. It just gets, you know, you just intensified a little bit. You know, you're getting ready to go to that next level, so you know you got to – you got to intensify because when, once you get to that next level, everybody's good. You don't, you don't, it don't, it, talent doesn't slack off once you get to that pro level. So you got 53 players and everybody at that level can play. So, you know, you have to, you have to increase your intensity. So when you get up there and, and the greatest thing about me is I, when I got to the Bengals, the Bengals ran almost the same offense that I ran when I was in college. They just had different terminology. So I just had to learn the different terminology, but we basically ran the same plays because I, I came from a, a one back offense where we had the, uh, the the running back in the backfield and we had an H back mm-hmm. out there. And when I got to the Bengals, they, they, had, they inquired that same thing. And so it was, uh, it was, it was fairly easy for for me to transition because we sort of ran the same offense and so all, all I had to do was learn the different tech uh, terminologies and audibles that they go along with that and you know once you get to that next level you have to you have to be able to comprehend you know the audibles because you can go in with one play and then a couple of words can change the whole play right right Marcus what about you 
The same thing, basically, uh, you know, I went to the USFL first. You know, I was a 19-year-old kid playing with men. Mm -hmm. And so, like you said, you, you know, people think football players are dumb. You got to understand the freaking audibles when you go in the game and know who you got to pick up at all times. Like you said, one word can change the whole play in the game. You know, you go in at one, like you said, when, we, when you go in with one play, you go in the hole and you just say one play, the quarterback goes up to the line of scrimmage. He started throwing out names and colors and, and numbers and, <laughs> and you know, your crowd is cheering. You got to understand that you got to stay focused because right. if you miss one block, you can get the quarterback killed or, or miss the whole play up. So, you know, a lot of you know, I get pissed when, you know, you got some few dumb players out there, true. <laughs> but, you know, to be a football player, you got to have some doggone sports, about you. especially when you move up to the league, to the NFL or the USFL or the CFL. CFL. You can't be sitting like a knot on a log. You got to understand what's going on at all times. No. And, and that's just, why a lot of, uh, a lot of, you see a lot of talented players who really didn't get to touch the field because they couldn't. They couldn't comprehend, man. They couldn't, right. couldn't catch the audibles. You know, that uh, that reminds me of a kid we had down here in Cincinnati, Reggie Rimber. You remember the wide receiver out of West Virginia? Yeah. I mean, just a specimen of a receiver, man. But he didn't get a chance to really touch the field because he couldn't, he, you know, he couldn't get the terminology and the audibles and everything. So he was out there, and, and they would audible to a different play, and he'd still run the play that was called in the huddle. So, you know. So there was a lot, a, a lot of talented guys who just didn't touch the field because they didn't have the, you know, didn't have the capacity to to comprehend what was going on. And you know, football players are not dumb. You know, we do have some, but mo for the most part, you got to have some intelligence to play the game. No, oh, no doubt. And that's what that's what I, I scouted with the Redskins and scouted in the CFL, CFL, and I always got people coming up to me. But why this kid didn't get drafted? Why this person didn't get drafted? And I always tell them it's always a reason why they don't right. get drafted. It's right. always a reason why you know that kid doesn't start on Sunday or Saturday because you guys don't see a lot of people don't well, most people don't see the practice during the week. And if right. the kid can't think or or comprehend like you said, and he ain't stepping on the field. And right. it's but like I say, it's always a reason why a kid don't get drafted or a kid is not playing. So I I, talk, I tell a lot of parents that don't, you know, you can't, you just can't look on Saturday or Sunday. You got to understand what go on, the preparation going on during the week. During the week, right. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you guys a question. We talking about the, the NFL. Icky, you were setting the trend as far as statements after touchdowns uh, <laughs> long before there was a prime time and so forth. Jason, show that, show that, show that clip. Tell me how this came about. This, <laughs> icky, this icky shuffle. Icky Woods with his second touchdown of the day. Man, I tell you, man, I was, I was sitting at home, and I had flew my mom in for a game against the Cleveland Browns, man. And at the time, my two oldest kids were five and two. Right. And I just got up, man, and I started acting silly. And I was like, Mom, if I score tomorrow, this is what I'm going to do. She's like, boy, you better not do that. I said, Mom, I got to. I got to. So it just started off where I just jumped in the air, man, just kind of put my hands in between my legs like that. And Ricky Dixon, who was our first-round draft choice, he was like, Woods, Woods, what was that? I said, oh, Rick, that was my celebration dance. He was like, man, that stuff was whack. <laughs> Like, what you mean, whack, Rick? He's like, yeah, man, that was whack. I say, so what you think I'd do, Rick? You think I'd put some steps to it, man? He was like, yeah, it put some steps to it. So, man, the whole week I'm thinking, what can I do? What can I do? And then five minutes before it was time to go out and get warm up, the shit just hit me. I said, Rick, check this out. This is what I'm going to do today if I score. I'm going to go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and I'm going to hop back three times and spike the ball. He was like, oh, yeah, it, man, that's going to be live. That's going to be live. And, you know, I tell everybody, man, I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time. We were winning ball games, and we ended up making it to the Super Bowl that year, man. I think that's that's really one of the main reasons that it caught on because if I was on a losing team, it probably would have never caught on. I was just 
you know, by the grace of God in the right place at the right time. And it just, it, it, bro. It, it just took off, man. It just took off. I never in my wildest dreams did I think that that, that thing was going to take off the way it did, man. I was just trying to find something to do for our home crowd. If you go back and look at all the ones that I did, it was always in the jungle, man. I never did it away from home because it was for our crowd, you know? So, Icky, yeah. what made you decide to stay in Cincinnati? I mean, clearly you're an icon in Cincinnati, but what was, was some of the main reason that you decided to make well, Cincinnati your home? Well, like I said, I'm, I'm from California, man, and uh, and uh, the cost of living, man, is crazy there. Right. At, the time, at the time that I was released, though, uh, from the Bengals, Cincinnati was the number one place to raise a family. And at that time, I was married with four kids. And the, and the opportunities here uh, were a lot more lucrative for me here because I played here. So we just decided... Uh, to stay put, man. I looked at going back to California, man. But at the time that I did that, I think uh, taxes were like 11%. Right. And you know, I could get a $250,000 home here that cost me ha cost me a meal and a half in California. So I said, I, I got more I got more bang for my buck here in Ohio, man. So I just Hold decided that. to stay. Hold that Hold thought, that. Icky, about family. We're going to come back to you. Marcus. Let's talk about some highlights that you have. What are some of the most memorable highlights that you have that you remember, whether it be man, college? Man, ain't got time enough in this show for all these highlights, man. That, that boy got so many highlights, man. We we, we to run all the time. That's, you know what? That's why I said let them know, Marcus. Go let them know, baby boy. So, so, so I guess the first highlight would be my first touchdown against Texas. You know, that's a, in the Red River shootout. Uh, oh. Coach Switzer calls me over to the sideline, and uh, so he calls a play, and then I start back to the huddle, and he calls me back over, and he go, big boy, keep it, because it's supposed to be a reverse to see Steve Sewell, who played for the Broncos for a long time. Right. It's supposed to be a reverse to him. And so he didn't know I was going to keep it, so he's looking for the ball. I keep the ball, go around the end, 75 yards. The rest is history. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's probably one of my biggest moments, I guess. Uh Against well, Nebraska, I had pneumonia, and a couple of days before we played, and we played right right at Thanksgiving, and I get out of the hospital, and I come straight to the game, and I still had 144 yards against uh, uh, Nebraska, which they had like four or five first round picks on that team. I mean, they were they had big. Remington, I think Remington played up there at Cincinnati. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remington I mean, was up in Cincinnati, boys, man. Mm -hmm. I mean. When they came on the field, I was standing on the middle. I was a freshman at that time, I, and they came on the field. I'm standing in the middle of the field on the 50-yard line, and the, when they came out on the field, my freaking helmet started shaking <laughs> on my head. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, man, just big time right here. Big boys, <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just big time. But uh, I had some great times in New Orleans, I guess, uh, going down there and getting ready to sign with the breakers. They took me around, took my mom around in one of those uh, carriages with the white horses and all that. So that made me feel, you know, like I was on heaven, being able to see my mom, my little brother, uh, riding around downtown New Orleans. So, uh, hey, it, 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 we could be here all day, really. But I want to tell, tell, tell Iggy, I, you know, my boy was Ricky Dixon. Yeah, 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 Ricky D, man. Yeah, I know, man. You, you know, me and Rick D came out together, man. We played a couple of All-Star games, you know. He was the first round draft choice. I was the second that year, man. Oh, okay. Here in Cincinnati, yeah. That was so, man. Yeah, so me and Rick up, got man. to be real cool, man. Oh, real, oh, yeah. real good brother, man. Real yeah, good no brother. Doubt, man. Yes, no doubt, man. Yes, sir. Doubt. You no know, doubt. He, he just passed one last yeah, year. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. I, I hit that too. Yeah, that yeah. was my guy, man. And it's coming. Oh, that, that, that boy was clean all the time, all wasn't he? Time. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell nothing, boy. I tell you what. Man, yeah, man. that sucker, that sucker dress, boy. Ricky D stayed clean all the time, baby. <laughs> Ricky D, yes, sir. <laughs> Mark Marcus, I'm gonna ask a question. Um, what was it like? Because you was the first millionaire, right? Contract, pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty much. What, what? I started. To, I guess you would say I started the big contracts, and then. Herschel came back in the USFL and started his. Then 
Then Steve Young got a big contract, so I guess you could say all. I guess you could say I was a one. Hmm. At nineteen, at nineteen years old, six million dollar contract was unheard of back then. Yeah, unheard of. Yeah, no doubt. Icky, what was it like when you got your contract? It wasn't as big as that. I can tell you that much, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good though, man. It was good. I think I, I, I you know, I was the first player taken in the second round, and at that time, I think I had I had got the biggest contract of a of a second round, and I think it was a three mil. I mean, it was a three years for one point six. I think it was one point so six uh, mil. It was big. It was big at that time, but like I said, it wasn't big as Dupree's you had there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, but you know they're bringing back. They say they're bringing the USFL back. Fox oh, is that back. right? Okay, okay. So, uh, so, and you know, that, and, and I ain't mad at that, man, because that that'll give more more guys an opportunity to get jobs, man. You yeah, know? Exactly. That's that's yeah. what I'm looking at, man. That's why. Yeah, man. You know, okay, so you're looking not at missing the name who who caused the USFL to go, but all you gotta do is go back and look at the thirty for thirty small potatoes who killed the USFL. Oh, you uh, already know that. that I, I think it might be our president. Yeah, it was that crazy some some of bond, you know. Yeah. We yeah. can say his name on here. It's fine. He can't do nothing to me. Right. <laughs> so, but, hey. Yeah, I mean, but it, I mean that was a great league. It produced a lot of good players that came from that league back into the NFL. I, I mean, I was hoping maybe it will, and maybe this I might be just talking out of turn, but I thought I think if the NFL put some money into the USFL. I think they're going to be it can be like a triple A team. Uh, people st- people love football down in the South year round. I know we had a great time in New Orleans, man. It was just it was. I mean, the New, the New Orleans Saints. We had the New Orleans Saints. We had the New Orleans Breakers, and the fans in Louisiana loved it. I mean, they we 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 average about forty five to fifty thousand people every game. Well, what about us the us us uh, usf Europe the Europe League? Well, you know, people in Europe they like football, but they ain't gonna like it like like they do over here, Miss Thornton, in the United States. Right. I mean, and that was a long way. I mean, you know, most of the people over there probably didn't even know who those players were. So you keep keep it in the keep it in the United States where people are recognizable. The 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 the, the families are gonna show up. The fans from the, the colleges are gonna show up, and. It, it, I just think you, just, you keep it here in the United States. It'll be, I think it'll be better. I mean, I, I didn't think NFL. I know what they were trying to do, probably trying to get a team over in the U, over in Europe, but that still didn't make sense to, to me. All right, we're gonna wrap up pretty soon. There's like a few more questions to ask. I'm gonna go back to to uh, Icky. Icky, talk about your family for a little bit. You now have um, um, you have a foundation. Tell me a little bit about the foundation and its, and its purpose, and a little bit about your family and how your, your how close your family support support is to you. Okay, well, I, I've always had a great family support, man. I, uh, with me, <clears throat> especially on my my mom's side of the family. Uh, my dad's side was my dad wasn't always there, so I kind of grew up in a one one parent home, and I was with my mom and my brother. And then my mom had six sisters and one brother. So we were, like I said, I had a lot of people praying for me and all of those were praying for me. And uh, me myself, I, I end up having uh, six kids. Um, I had three boys and three girls, uh, real gra- real proud grandfather of seven, soon to be eight. Mm, congratulations. I, yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. And um, I uh, actually lost my middle son to asthma in 10 years ago. And I started a foundation in his name called the Javante Woods Foundation. And what I do now is I go around the country raising money for asthma research and asthma education uh, to educate, especially our people on how severe and serious asthma really is. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know asthma could kill because I didn't know and I grew up with asthma and I never never knew that asthma could kill till it took my baby from me. And then I started doing some research on it and come to find out asthma is the fastest growing disease in America. Since 1980, asthma has risen 80% in the kids from the age of being born to the age 19. And a real alarming statistic that just kind of blew me out the water is that 11 people a day die from asthma. And I couldn't 
couldn't understand that. And then, so we started the foundation, hopefully one day to find a cure, if not to find a cure, hopefully uh, find a better way to treat asthma so we're not losing uh, so many people. But it's been a, it's been a adventure and we're, and we're still working hard every day. It's been rough, not only for me, but I guess for everybody uh since we went through this pandemic man we wasn't able to do fundraising uh because we weren't able to do any social distancing and, and, and things of of that nature and that's how we do it. a lot of our fundraisers by social gathering right you know, uh so so hopefully uh that that chapter is behind us and we can move forward and and get back on track to raising money and if you want to take a look at the foundation is Jovante and that's spelled J O V A N T E Woods foundation.org is the website. I think we got that put, we got that put up in the background. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool, got that cool. put up in the background. So Icky, uh, are you available for like public appearances and, and outside of the foundation? Yeah. And okay. they can reach you at the same place. We're always willing to do, uh, personal appearances, you know, speak to kids, crowds, it, it don't matter. You just let me know what you need me to touch on and we'll make it happen. Hey, I'm gonna tell the viewers this and and, and um, uh, briefly, when I went to Cincinnati, I think in 2000 and, no, 1996, I wound up being a school teacher. And Aki, this is tripped out. The first person I asked to meet was you. <laughs> Okay. Got, yeah, when I got to when I got to Cincinnati, I was like, "Hey, I don't want to see nobody but Icky Woods." <laughs> and everybody's like, "Oh, he's around. You'll see him." <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, and, oh yeah. What what one to hide, man? You know. You know so, what what I what what I can honestly say that I like about about you is I followed your career. I remember your senior year. That's when I heard about you, I followed you, and I was like, man, this dude, I already knew you was going to go to the NFL. There was no questions about it. My thing is, I wish you had went to the Cowboys. How does that make you feel that you, if you had to go to a team, and I'm going to ask Marcus this too, what team did you really want to go to? When you got that chance to go to the NFL, you don't have a choice on who picks you, but you know who you want to go to. Oh, yeah, man. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a diehard Raider fan, man. Okay. I grew up on the Raiders being from California, man. So I, I actually wanted to uh, go to the Raiders, man. And um, I thought they were going to take me. Oh, well, if the Bengals wouldn't have took me to – I think they had, they had like four picks uh, after the Bengals. If the Bengals wouldn't have took me at the 31st, uh, they were going to take me like 35 or 36. And then uh, – I, th I actually thought I was going to the Bears, but they took uh, Brad Mustard out of Stam. Yeah, I remember him. Uh, Marcus, what about you? What team did you want to go to? Did we lose him? Hey, yeah, I think we lost. He said he was a big Saints fan coming up. Oh, okay. So, so everybody want everybody wanted to be a, a Saints back when back where he was from. So I think he probably wanted to be a Saint. He probably chimed back in. He yeah, probably just lost the next. So. Icky, uh, with the found with the foundation and and, and your son, um, have have there been any research done, any any advancements in the the asthma quest? It's get, it's getting better, man. We're you know um, they are starting to to have more preventive type uh, measures where they they have some medicine medicine that once you get it over con under control, you can take this medicine and it kind of keep it preventative, kind of keep it under control. So they're in a process of getting that together. And then they have spacers and things that we um, try to go to our community and, you know, people who can't afford uh, the medicine or the spacers, we try to provide that for them as well. During the, during the uh, pandemic, there's been a lot of, like you said, uh, problems that we were facing from racial tension to um, health care to you name it is out there what would you do different to help soothe or what words of comfort could you give the people right now um, to now that we are able to go back out and socialize is there any positive things you can tell people right I, now you know I, I think the most important thing my brother's education 
you know, if you can, if we can educate people on, you know, what to do in a certain situation or, you know, what to look for and what they can do in, in case something happened, most people don't know. Right. And, if you don't, and if you don't know and you're not educated about what to do, you can lose somebody, you know, right there in front of your face, man. So, you know, and, and I think that's the most important thing is, is getting out and educating, you know, people in general, but our people um, more frequently, man, because because we just don't know. Mm. Icky, I'm going to ask you one last question. Leave something very vital to the community and to the world as we move forward into 2021. I would say, man, it's just, you know, it's going to be hard, but just, just, just love the next person, man, you know, and just try to encourage and uplift people, man. We got too much hate in the world going on right now. You know, we're, we're so divided as a, as a race and culture, you know, black against white, Orientals against white, Orientals against black. We just not, you know, they call us the big melting pot, but we're not the big melting pot, man, because we got so much hate going on right now, brother. I think we just need to get, try to get away from the hate, man, and love each other and just, you know, just, you know, be, be human about it, brother. That's all I can say to people, man. Just be a, a decent human being to everybody and treat everybody like you like to be treated. That sounds totally awesome. You know, I appreciate you coming onto the show, man. I mean, you've been truly great. Thanks for working with me. You know, you're definitely one of my idols. Uh, um, it's almost like, you know, the power of prayer. If you put it out there, it happens. And I've always, always asked for the opportunity to, to meet you, to have you uh, pretty much as one of my friends. And uh, I, I'm really blessed that you allowed me the opportunity to interview you today on, on the oh, show. Brian, it's all good, man. Anytime we can talk positive, man, and bring some light to the situation that's going on, brother, I'm all about that. Uh, you know, I used to live in Cincy, though. I used to live in a Beachmont. Oh, you was out in the Beachmont area, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I know in, exactly where you was at. Living in the Beachmont, and actually, <laughs> actually, I was, actually, I was out there. I used to live out in Eastgate, too. For real? I was actually yeah, I was, a school teacher I, I there. I was out there by the Eastgate Mall, man. I was out in that Beachmont area for a little bit, too. Out there in Batavia area. Yeah, yeah. I used to train in Batavia, but okay. I taught school in uh, Ezra Charles, Ezra Charles over... Um, off of um, and St. Joseph's and St. Uh, I think it's called St. Monica's. Okay. So, so I was a school okay. teacher there for like five five years, but I commuted every right. day from Minneapolis to Cincinnati. And everybody's like, you drive from okay. back and forth. I was like, it's yeah, about, it's not, about the kids. Like, look, that's like an hour and 15 minutes, <laughs> ain't it, uh, one way. <laughs> look, you don't, you, you're not in the car with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay yeah. well, you you drive like me then. Yeah. We, we turn it about 50 minutes then. Yeah, huh? <laughs> I, turned it, I turned it down real quick. We'd like to thank Marcus. I'm sorry we lost him for being yeah, on the show. Um, I really, I'm really glad I get to connect you two because I can see a lot of memories and, and so oh, forth oh, that definitely, you guys had. Definitely. So, Icky, well, we gonna well, have... get off here, man. Won't you shoot me uh, his digits, man, so I can keep in contact with the brother? I will definitely do that. And you know what? We're gonna have you back on the show. And I'll be in Cincinnati. We gotta go eat, eat some food in Cincinnati somewhere. Let's do it, brother. Let's do it. They got a gang of spots we can go, man. I know you. Had, I know you had the Montgomery and Ridge. I know you had them. <laughs> before we go, before we go, yeah, I've eaten there. They oh, bought yeah. they bought that here in Indianapolis. Oh, oh, did they? Okay. But for some reason, they was bringing the food in fresh, and they couldn't keep up with it. And it, okay. it I think it lasted for less than less than a year. And I'm like, look, you need right. to really go to the Montgomery Inn that's in Cincinnati. You can't oh, bring yeah. that to Indianapolis. Oh yeah. <laughs> with that said, sure. ladies and gentlemen, this has been the one, the only. Cincinnati Bengals, UNLV Rubble, Mr. Icky Albert Woods on the Andre yes, the Beast yes, Show. Yes, sir. That's me, baby. <laughs> Appreciate you, dog. All right. Thank you so All much. All right, man. Have a good one. You too.